Storytelling is an act of service, really. We are there to, to serve the listeners. Without our listeners, we'd be nothing. His name was Tistu, and he had blue eyes, golden hair, and fresh rosy cheeks. People kissed him a lot. <laughs> a story is like food, and uh, what we are interested in is, is sharing that food together. So I need to be sensitive in the story that I'm telling as to whether what I'm saying is nourishing to you. And it comes about through a kind of dialogue. So I have to watch you very closely to see if you're still with me. I have to stop my story sometimes and let you ask questions. Um, it's not just a one-way street telling a story. It's a, it's a listening, it's a dialogue that happens between us. Tistu was born in a little town in France, Mirepoix. His parents were very rich. They lived in a magnificent house surrounded by a splendid garden. Storytelling for me is a way of life. Just as we need food to eat and air to breathe, so we need stories in order to make sense of who we are and what we're doing on this planet. So whenever I meet somebody and I'm interested in finding out about them, they will tell me their story. The great physicist, he said, we are made of stories, not atoms. So it's how we actually negotiate our way in life. Those are the stories we tell. Our name is a story. How did we get our name? The clothes we wear, a story. The shoes I'm wearing today, well, if I look at those shoes, I think of the man who gave them to me, who came from a township in South Africa. Or um, this pair of trousers that I picked up in Spain. There's a story behind that. Or this jersey that my girlfriend gave me. You know, all of these different things have stories. If we look closely, stories are behind everything that we see and do. Tissu's mother was fair, slender, around her neck, wrists, fingers gleamed diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and when she came into the room she smelt like a bed of roses. Whenever Tissu was alone in the house, he'd run to the top of the grand staircase and slide all the way down. It was his private toboggan, his magic railroad, his flying carpet, and there, at the bottom stood Carolus, the manservant, frantically polishing the banisters till they shone. Oh, so mio. There is a visible world and there's an invisible world. And as storytellers, we're midwives between the two worlds. As soon as I say, once upon a time in India, we've gone to India. We've left Cambridge. <laughs> And we've travelled, we've travelled in time. And that's what we are as storytellers, we're time travellers. So I looked for a profession that, in a way, had a foot in both worlds. A foot in this world and a foot in an invisible world. Because in the world of our imaginations, we're constantly travelling, we're constantly um, going to other places. And that's what we are as human beings. We're not just what we can see physically, we're much more than that. And that's what the storytellers celebrated in the past, that we are as physical beings, but we're also, if you like, um, spiritual beings. And I wanted to find a profession that had a foot in both worlds and could celebrate that. But the higher he climbed, the easier it seemed to become. Soon the wind had fallen, noise faded into silence, the sun shone like a huge ball of fire, but it did not burn. 
The earth was no more than a shadow. Then it too was gone. Tisto didn't even notice that the ladder had come to an end, but he was still rising easily, effortlessly upwards. Then, all of a sudden, he felt the brush of an enormous white wing. What makes a good story? Well, there's only one answer. I'll tell you a story, <laughs> and then we'll look at it. This is a story that comes from China. A man whose axe was missing suspected his neighbor's son. The boy walked like a thief, talked like a thief, looked like a thief. But the next day, the man found his axe while digging in the valley. And the next time he saw his neighbor's son, the boy walked, talked, and looked just like any other child. That's a short little story. But inside that story, there is the key to what makes any good story. In a good story, there's a problem. Something is missing. Something calls us. Something challenges us. The great teacher Thomas Aquinas said that every great work of art, and I would include in this stories, every great story has three qualities, levitas, gravitas, harmonium. And uh, we feel that inside this story, this very simple story. It's a serious matter. He's lost his axe. You know? <laughs> and then he finds it digging in the valley the next day, a little bit of lightness. And then things are restored to the harmony. And the next time he saw his neighbor's son, the boy walked, talked, and looked just like any other child. Something in us breathes in a good story. Something in us feels the seriousness, the weight, the gravitas of a situation. And then we breathe a sigh of relief, and then we can carry on again. And so if you look at the stories, the great works of art, you'll see that they have these qualities. And a storyteller leads us through the landscape of the stories they tell in this way. And because my spirit lives in my breath, and your spirit lives in your breath, what a good story does is it bathes, it washes us in a way. And um, it helps us feel the tight places, the places we are free, and the places which are perhaps the most precious of all, the places where we are in harmony, where we hold the center, and where we can see things with a big perspective. I don't know if you're the same, but if anybody shouts at me, I never listen. But if they start to whisper, I always want to know what's going on. For some time now, there's been a good deal of whispering in Mirepoix. There were secrets in the air, even in the carpets of the shining house. Tistu's father and mother sighed deeply as they read the newspapers over breakfast. Amelia and Caroluce talked in undertones over the washing machine. Even Mr. Turnbull seemed to have lost his trumpet-like voice. Then, one morning, there was a new word on everybody's lips. War. The most recent book that I've written with my friend and colleague, Sue Hollingsworth, is called The Storyteller's Way. And this is a book of storytelling techniques, if you like, how to tell good stories. How It's a guide for inspired storytelling. And in that book, we share some of the insights and some of the background about good storytelling and what goes into the storyteller's art. So there are lots of exercises in there. There are lots of stories in there that people can use and uh, techniques, very simple techniques really about what it is to, to meet and what it is to be able to tell a story, um, pick up a traditional story and to, to make it your own. So um, these are 
things that we've developed over 21 years at the International School of Storytelling. And people come to us from all walks of life. So we get people coming to us who want to become storytellers. And then there are those who are teachers, who are therapists, who are working in the environment, who are activists, um, really from every walk of life. Because more and more people are realizing that this is what it's all about. Mr. Turnbull was in the factory office. He had recovered his trumpet-like voice and was shouting into three telephones at once. Tanks, trucks, machine guns, helmets. <laughs> it's always like this when war breaks out, Tissue. Our work here is doubled at once. I'll come back when you're not so busy, Mr. Turnbull. What we have found with storytelling in business is that any great business leader is also a great storyteller. So in business, we help people to tell the story of their business. Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about branding. And basically, that's what's the story in your business? What makes your business unique? And if you've got a good story to tell, then you'll probably find that you'll be able to reach people better. Some years ago, Harvard did a survey, a 20-year survey, about what made for successful businesses. And the one thing that all of the successful businesses had in common was good communication. That's basically good storytelling. So you'll find that, for instance, if there's a merger that goes on in, in business, then um, you've got two companies and they each have separate stories. And now they've got to create a third story, a new story. And so we will help them create that new identity. A story is basically a form of identity. It's who you are. And if you don't have a clear narrative, if you don't have a clear story to tell, that will you know, really differentiate you and make you stand out as the leader in a particular field, then people won't really be able to find you, reach you and say, yes, this is the company we want to work with. So storytelling is helping us in a way shape our identity in a more strongly and clearly defined manner. And there are the hero stories, of course, inside the business. There is the man or the woman who went out and won that contract. That's a kind of modern hero story. There are hero stories about what has happened on, on the shop floor and uh, just individuals who have stood out and have done something that has made a huge difference and sometimes a fortune for, for the entire company. Um, the story of the, the Sonny Walkman actually, is about a man who had been with the company for quite some time and he was often tinkering around with new ideas and no one really wanted to listen to him. And then one day someone gave him some attention and really, you know, took him seriously. And, you know, now <laughs> we know we're all listening to those devices. And it, all it took was a, was a moment of attention, of taking someone seriously. He had an idea, that was a story, basically. So how well can we, can we listen? How well can we actually um, uh, yeah, reach for the, for, the, for the gold and see each person individually and the contribution, the story they have to tell? And that's what the work that we can do in, in the storytelling in business, to actually bring more humanity into the workplace. The plan was immediately put into effect. Its success was overwhelming. Mr. Turnbull was put in charge of publicity. He had huge posters put up all over the town. Plant mirepoix flowers that grow overnight. Plant the flowers that grow even on steel. But the best one of all was, say no to war, but say it with flowers. <laughs>I think for me the, the most important thing is that people can create their own 
pictures that they can have their own imagination. And the thing about so much of the movie industry is that we are hungry for stories, otherwise it wouldn't be such a multi-million dollar industry. Um, but we're even hungrier for being able to actually create our own pictures, create our own stories. So when that is not fed, then we reach out for things outside of us. Um, and uh, of course the tendency is in all the cultures to be told by the advertising agencies, the marketing agencies, that in order to you know, be a worthwhile human being, you need this and you know, you've got to have this product and that and this car and this suit and all those kind of things. Um, but that's not really honoring <laughs> what each person is as an individual. It's so sad now, I go around to different countries and whether I'm in Australia or whether I'm in Italy or whether I'm in Turkey or in America, you know, all of the cities look the same. There's the same shops there, there's the same brand names and, and each place is losing its individuality. Is that the kind of world we want? Are those the kind of human beings that we want to meet? No, I want to meet you, I want to go to a particular place and I want to meet what is special about that place, what is special about that person. So if we don't feed the imagination, if we don't cultivate what is unique in each person and, and what is different in each person, then we're really in danger of, of wrecking civilizations, wrecking cultures and just erasing what we are as individuals. But there are huge forces out there that are tooth and nail against us being individuals that are there to just erase individual voices and that don't appreciate us as individuals. Tis do what was I saying? Oh, a leg or a tart or cut off a part. <laughs> Go to the bottom of the class. On Tistu's first day at school, he got zero for everything. On his second day, he was made to stay behind two extra hours. That's how long he slept in school. On the third day, the teacher handed him a letter for his parents. It read, Sir, your son is not like other people. We cannot keep him at this school. The school had sent Tistu home to his parents. We need stories in order to really find out what is it that we share. We need stories in order to feel safe, in order to actually know that we are living a life that has meaning. The great author Isaac Dennison once said, a person is a person because they have a story to tell. If I don't have a story to tell, who am I? Or if somebody else is telling my story, then what? Then I haven't yet found a direction, a direction that's my own. And each one of us is given a very specific and unique way of seeing and knowing this world and telling that story. That's what makes us human beings. So it's very important that you tell your story and I tell my story and I, I listen to what makes you unique. So the stories are a way of seeing, a way of meeting one another. The prison was me. The morning glories in the slums was me. The nettles on the seats, that was me too. 
Tissu's father and Mr. Turnbull went on staring at him like a couple of cows in a field. They don't believe me. I'm going to have to prove it to them. Tissu went to the mantelpiece above which hung a picture, a picture of his grandfather, the veritable founder of the Miropa factory, painted leaning against a magnificent cannon. He held his thumbs there for a moment. The picture began to shake and suddenly out of the mouth of the cannon shot a huge chrysanthemum. <laughs> there, I've got green thumbs. So when I tell a story and we can meet through the story, we can get a little closer to one another and we begin to get that food, that nourishment that I think we need. And that's, reason, that, that's one of the reasons why storytelling um, is becoming so popular again. Because from one point of view, life's getting faster and faster and we're spending more and more time on these gadgets and stuff like this. But from another point of view, we're getting further and further away from, from, from each other. And we want the simplicity of what we have had from the beginning which we're in danger of losing, and that's just our humanity, and that's caring for one another and realizing just how interconnected we are. So, story can be the, the link, again, to make the connections that we're in danger of losing. Science is, is showing now that actually it's the stories it's the stories that create the pathways in the brain. So if we can find the new stories, if we can find uh, a way of being together that is not separate but actually helps us see that everything is connected to everything else, and we create then systems, different kind of systems, out of which we can um, be more connected and realize that we're not so isolated, then that's really exciting as storytellers. It's like we're collectively creating new ways of, of being together that, that um, um, will become a, a, the sort of future, the future story that we want to live in into. That's why Imagination is so important. Uh, that's why storytelling is just really the bedrock of, of everything that has been and also will be. So that when his mother and father came out the next morning, they found his favourite slippers and there, written in the flowers, these words, Tistu était un ange. Tistu was an angel.